Okay class, welcome back to another installment of our exercise prescription series. Uh, lectures within this series. Um, we are on lecture C now and uh, we have talked about thus far some of the important variables that are involved in that FIT principle. Um, thus far we've talked about frequency and intensity and we kind of explored uh, what those look like as far as a um, recommended frequency and recommended intensity for uh, individuals that are not at risk, so just kind of the healthy population. And now we're going to get into type. So we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of ways we can stimulate skeletal muscle uh, to get health benefits, to get um, exercise-induced adaptations, to get specific adaptations that we want for performance. We're going to talk a little bit about volume today. Volume is a confusing topic. Uh, a lot of people get volume uh, mixed up with um, frequency. And we're also going to talk about progression. So we'll get, uh, we'll get into these today, and this should take us to the conclusion of our three-part series in exercise prescription. So let's dive into this. I hope you are all well. I hope you are all safe. I hope you are all consuming lots of vegetables and exercising and keeping that innate and adaptive immune response very high and very sensitive to the needs of your body. So if we get any of those uh, icky pathogens coming into the coming into your system, you have the appropriate defense and you can defend yourself against some of those uh, microorganisms that want to do very awful things to your body. So let's get into this. Let's talk about type. Um, now type is going to refer to the type of exercise that, or the type of stimulus we use to deliver um, to our our um, client or our team that we're working with. Um, so it is a delivery system of a particular stimulus. And as you can see here, I have very unique um, exercises that are occurring. And the reason I put these pictures up here, because when it comes to type, when it comes to the type of exercise we're going to deliver, if you look down here, I said specificity is very important. So you can see here that you have two gentlemen practicing their golf swing on a BOSU ball. So they are working stability. They are um, challenging stability as their golf club is being swung across their transverse abdominis um, in a transverse plane of motion. And therefore, they're going to increase their stroke and their distance um, and their power output by challenging the proprioception or the stability part of this training. You can see here a uh, very similar application, but you can see that this individual is being challenged even more so because he is doing a single leg swing and he also has the load in the form of a medicine ball, which is a bit harder because now this load is... Um, it is centered around this dense ball, where if we look at the golf club here, the heavy portion is up here, right? So this individual has a bit more leverage. Um, the weight is distributed across a greater surface area, so it's a little easier to swing where here the weight is consolidated. So if we're delivering a specific stimulus, there would be a natural order of advancement, right? We could start with something like this and then move into something like this. Likewise, we have an individual here using a BOSU ball and a medicine ball, working stability. Uh, and again, this is very specific training for very specific outcomes. And that is your job to determine what those outcomes are, okay? If we have a race car driver, Right? A lot of people would consider a race car driver someone who is not athletic. However, professional race car drivers, they work with personal trainers. So what kind of, what kind of delivery system would you apply to them? How would you provoke a stimulus that would be functional and purposeful for sitting in the car and driving for long periods of time at high rates of speed? These are things you have to think about as someone who is going to be training people to make them better. So um, we have a couple different types of workout types. We can have an rhythmic and aerobic sort of exercise regimen. So that would be 
a continuous exercise program. You can see that here, continuous, where we are not allowing breaks in between. We are making the individual uh, work out for a long period of time. And because it is a long period of time, we are naturally taxing the aerobic system. Um, and it is rhythmic because if you think about riding a bike or swimming or um, running a long distance, there's a cadence to that, right? So you can maintain a certain intensity while uh, keeping a particular cadence um, going. So another thing we can do is have a discontinuous type of exercise. Now that would be an anaerobic exercise that would generally not be rhythmic because it's discontinuous, so it's a lot of stop and go, right? Rather than continuous, um, you would do high intensity rest or high intensity, low intensity rest, or you could shift from high intensity to low intensity to high intensity to low intensity, right? And with those shifts, you're also changing the metabolic pathways that you're utilizing during those those exercises, okay? So some things to think about with type is we can have an anaerobic, which would be discontinuous. We would have an aerobic, which would be continuous. We could have a type of exercise, which is high intensity interval training. That should be an I, not a T. I apologize for that. Um, where we're focusing on power output and endurance. We could have uh, moderate intensive training. We can even have a low intensity training, right? So in what manner, when we're talking about type, in what manner are we going to challenge not only the skeletal muscle, but the cardiovascular to, the cardiovascular and the cardiorespiratory system, okay? Uh, because they're just as important as the skeletal muscle. So we have to keep all these factors in mind when we're designing um, a program. So let's look uh, a little more at this idea of specificity and how stimulus or the type of exercise changes not only the form but also the function of skeletal muscle okay so let's take a look at this paper that i found in the journal of exercise physiology and we'll examine some of these particulars uh, a little a little more closely so we have two images here and on the left hand side on this guy here we can see that we have three different delivery systems or we're going to call these training formats okay we have moderate intensity training we have high intensity interval training and then we have super intense training sit okay we can see that these types of training systems have been delivered three days a week okay Intensity is obviously determined by um, what we'll see here on the left, the uh, y-axis, right? So if we look at moderate intensity training, you can see that we have the y and the x. And we'll say that the moderate intensity training is about one and a half, okay? So we'll just call this arbitrary units. It's one and a half arbitrary units, which means it's moderate intensity. Now, if we look at the high intensity interval training, we're at one, two, two, and we'll just say, we'll say, let's round it up and just say three, okay? The high intensity training is at three arbitrary units, all right? So it's uh, three times as much as the moderate intensity training. Now, if we look at the super intense training, let's, let's quantify what the intensity is of this training. So one, two, three, four, okay? So it is, it is higher than the high intensity training, right? So we have 1.5, 3, and 4. And these are just arbitrary units that just met, that just um, represent how intensely the person is working. Okay, now let's look at time. Okay, let's, fam let's familiarize ourselves with the x-axis here. We can see that when we're doing moderate intensity exercise, there is no break. You see how this line is continuous? So that would represent continuous rhythmic exercise with no rest in between. When we look at high intensity interval training, we can see that there's a dip in intensity and then a rise in intensity, a dip in intensity and a rise in intensity, okay? Now, we don't know if this dip in intensity is rest or if it's just lower intensity, okay? We don't, we don't have that information in front of us, but you can see that there is a difference in moderate intensity training versus high intensity training. Now, if we look at super intensity training, okay, we can see that there is 
a surge, a decrease, a surge, a decrease, a surge, and a decrease. Now, if we compare high intensity, okay, this guy here, to super intense training, the one thing we'll notice is not only is the intensity higher, but the width of the bars are greater in high intensity. So that means that in high intensity training, you can, because the intensity is lower, you can do the activity for a longer period of time, right? So we have this width here, which represents a time frame. And then you can see that the width here is very short. So that means that when that decrease in intensity is a very short amount of time. And then we have an increase in intensity and you can see that this is maintained for the width of this bar. And then we have another decrease. Now, the big difference is look at the width of this bar, right? Very slender. So what we increase with intensity, we decrease in duration, right? Or in, in, in the amount of time that we're doing this exercise, right? So if we look at low intensity exercise, we have a long duration, there's no rest, right? If we have a moderately intensive exercise, we have um, less of a continuous duration and we have rest, go, rest, go, rest, go. Now, if we look at a super intense exercise, we can see that the duration, the, the, the amount of time that the individual is exercising is very little, right? So there's three different ways to skin a cat here, okay? And what these three different modalities are going to do is tax the skeletal muscle and the cardiovascular system in very different and unique ways, okay? And there's gonna be lots of mechanisms that will change and alter the skeletal muscle based upon the stimulus that is being delivered. And this is the stimulus. Is the stimulus long, slow, and continuous? Is, this, is the stimulus intense um, with breaks in the middle? Is the stimulus super intense with uh, greater time periods of rest, but more uh, intense periods of work, okay? So these types of exercises or these types of de stimulus delivery are going to alter the muscle in very unique ways. And we have to be able to understand how they're going to change the muscle, especially if we're working with a team, right? If you have a team with several different positions, you may want to put one of the players through this type of training. You might want to put one of the players through this type of training. You might want to put one of the players through this training and this training concurrently. You have to understand how the physiology works to understand why we're prescribing certain types of exercise, okay? So some of the, some of the adaptations that are, can occur with these types of training modalities is, well, they're all gonna add cellular stress to the skeletal muscle, right? And that stress is a good thing because that stress is gonna cause intercellular changes, which is therefore going to cause adaptations to the muscle, right? So we're gonna have cellular stress, and a molecular response to that cellular stress. Some of these things might be an increase in mitochondria content, right? So we might get more mitochondria. That would make sense if we're doing this type of exercise. However, a lot of research is showing that high intensity exercise training, interval training also increases mitochondria. So do you wanna do this one to increase mitochondria or this one? Um, it also increases capillary density. So a lot of research shows that mitochondria or moderate intensity exercise and HIIT training uh, and super intense training all increase capillary density. So now you got to decide which one are you going to use, okay? Also, these types of trainings induce maximum cardiac output. They increase it. Maximum stroke volumes increase. Blood volume increases. And we know when blood volume increases, it has a direct impact on cardiac output and stroke volume and we have increases in VO2. So do we use one? Do we use two? Do we use all of them to get these changes? Well, let's look at what's going on on the molecular side of things. So let's move over here and we can see how these changes in the muscle upregulate different proteins or different kinases that make the skeletal muscle want to change, okay? So if we have our uh, myosin and actin here, right? and we have great contraction rates, right? We can see that myosin and actin are contracting. Those Z bands are getting closer to one another. Well, 
then that is going to cause an increase in ATP turnover, which means we're going to have higher AMP and ADP in the cell. Now, when we have a high level of AMP or ADP in the cell, that triggers a stress response, okay? So we can, we can assume that if we're doing a higher intensity training, so look at this guy here and look at this guy here, we're going to burn through ATP at a much quicker rate, all right? So what happens if we're doing high intensity training? Well, we're gonna have high ATP turnover. We're gonna tax the ATP creatine kinase phosphocreatine system, right? We know that that system is trying to replenish ATP as quickly as it can. We know that if we're doing high intensity training, we will get into the glucose utilization much quicker. And we know when we do high intensity training, we probably won't get into much oxidative pathways at all, okay? Um, which is here, this would be the oxidative pathway. Now, high intensity training in this manner, because you can see the frequency of exercise is greater, where here it seems the frequency of rest is greater, right? You see that white space there, there's just more rest than there is exercise. This type of training, because of the frequency of exercise might stimulate the mitochondria right? it might might stimulate um, fatty acid utilization and aerobic um, metabolic pathway activation all right now if this represents low intensity exercise rather than rest we can assume that if we're doing continuous exercise over the course of this entire time period with just high intensity and low intensity we're going to get into that oxidative pathway here we might not get into that oxidative pathway, okay? So I hope this is making sense to you. Now, if we're using um, moderate intensity exercise, we might not tax these systems, we might not tax the ATP phosphocreatine system uh, and deplete it, right? We might not deplete it because the intensity of exercise is so low. Here, we're probably going to deplete it, okay? Since we won't deplete the ATP phosphocreatine system, we're probably not going to tax the glycolytic system either, which means in this type of training, we're going to get into the mitochondria um, and the beta oxidation and the Krebs cycle um, much more effectively because it's a continuous exercise, okay? Something else to keep in mind is what is calcium doing during exercise, right? This is another uh, molecule that has a, a very profound effect on what, how the skeletal muscle changes. So if we think about calcium being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum when we're doing exercise like this, calcium in exercise like this is going to be a very steady release, very steady uptake, and very consistent concentration of calcium in the cell. Now, in a situation like this, we might see calcium uptake in this section, high volumes of calcium released in this section with high intensity, right? Greater muscle contraction, greater release of calcium, okay? Then as we slow down, we'll have an uptake of calcium, so that calcium will go back into the ryanodine receptor and be sucked back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, high intensity, more calcium released, okay? So these are calcium cycles. And the way calcium leaves and re-enters the sarcoplasmic reticulum, as you can see here, that will, that will cause certain changes in the muscle, okay? And same thing here. If we have low here in this white area, we would have calcium being taken back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Here, we would have a flood of calcium being secreted. In this space here, calcium would go back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Here, we would have a massive surge of calcium going into the cell, okay? So I think you guys get the gist is that these different types of contraction are going to release calcium in very different patterns into, um, into the cytosol of the muscle cell, okay? Now, calcium um, will activate a kinase called CAMK. Okay, um, it could also interact with AMPK. These are kinases, and these kinases will activate certain transcription factors. Now, one, one um, transcription factor that AMPK likes to activate is this guy right here called PCG, PGC1 alpha. Okay, and what this guy does is when AMPK activates him, he tells the mitochondria 
to make more mitochondria, okay? So different types of exercise and something as simple as calcium can change the form and function of skeletal muscle, all right? And there's, there's other things that, uh, that do this as well, right? Um, ADP, if we have high levels of ADP in the cell, these are signaling molecules, right? That will change the muscle. AMP will change the muscle. Certain free radicals, this guy here is hydrogen peroxide. This guy here is um, um, a super radical. This is here is, is hydrogen, right? Inorganic phosphate. All of these things in certain concentrations within the cell will cause molecular changes in the cell. And the more we do this through exercise, right? If we exercise and this is constantly happening, happening it changes the form and the function of the cell in a way that is represented by the stimulus that is stressing the cell, okay? So if this stimulus, which is continuous rhythmic exercise, if it is stressing the cell and it's telling the cell that it has to become more oxidative, skeletal muscle has to become more oxidative, well, guess what? It's going to activate certain kinases that tell the uh, mitochondria to start producing more of itself, and then we get more mitochondria protein synthesis, and when we get more mitochondria, this exercise doesn't feel as tough anymore. It's not as difficult, okay? So I know that was long-winded, but I had to explain it. And something to think about is the type of exercise, the delivery of the stimulus that we purposely give an individual or a team um, is going to have specific exercise-induced adaptations. So the type of exercise we give that we prescribe is going to be like programming the body, okay? And that's why I have this binary code here. You are programming how you want the body to adapt and to be able to perform. So do you want the body to be stronger? Do you want the person to be able to lift more weights, okay? Do you want the person to be able to have more stability and have more core stability? Do you want the person to be more explosive and have more ground force production and increased speed? Do you want that person to have a little bit of all of this, okay? You have to determine how you're gonna deliver it, what that delivery is going to do to the cell, and when the cell, or I'm sorry, the, the skeletal tissue, let's just talk about it as tissue now, we're, let's get out of the cell. Is the skeletal muscle going to respond to these changes I'm sorry, to these delivery types to get these type of responses, okay? So you have to keep all that in mind. Very, very, very important. Um, what you see here is just ACSM's recommendations for uh, certain types of exercises, um, modes of aerobic cardiorespiratory endurance, exercise to improve physical fitness. So you guys can look at this at your own pace, at your own speed. Um, it just gives you different types of aerobic uh, exercise suggestions, it tells you who these people are good for and the examples of those types of exercises, right? So jogging can be aerobic, running's aerobic, rowing's aerobic, aerobics, obviously that's aerobic, spinning, elliptical, okay? All these things are aerobic when the intensity and the duration is kept in mind. If I change the intensity, right, to a high intensity exercise, right? So let's let's just let's just look back at that last slide, right? All of these can be applied this way. Moderate intensity, continuous, right? There's no breaks in between, continuous and for long periods of time, right? Now, all of those same exercises, rowing, running, jogging, um, what were some other ones that were over there? Uh, spinning, elliptical. If you increase the intensity, you can change the way you're delivering that stimulus, right? So now you have a discontinuous exercise because you increase the intensity, right? And when we increase the intensity, that directly impacts time. Because time here, I can't do this continuously because the intensity is so, so hard, right? Um, and the same thing here. If I do super intense versions of those exercises, then I've gone almost to completely anaerobic, right? So I can take this aerobic idea 
and I can change these aerobic uh, apparatus, right? Rowing, elliptical, treadmill, and I can make them high intensity and super intense. And again, the way I deliver it is going to alter the way the muscle interprets it. And then the muscle is going to alter itself and give you a specific adaptation. Okay. Um, so we can do anaerobic as well. So I, I, uh, ACSN just kind of told you that, you know, you can do these, these variations of aerobic training. Well, we can do variations of strength training as well. We're going to get into volume in a second. So don't, don't, don't worry too much about this here. Um, I'm just talking about different types of exercise, right? So we talked about aerobic. Let's talk about anaero anaerobic. And if we talk about anaerobic, we can talk about weightlifting. Okay. Well, there's more than one way to weightlift, right? Do we want to build strength and power? Do we want to build hypertrophy? Do we want to do, do we want to build muscle endurance? Do we want the athlete to have a little bit of all of these, right? Again, we have to keep these in mind. If we're doing strength and we look at the rep range and the set range, strength training is less than six and the sets are between two and six. Now let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum. Let's do muscle endurance. If we want to do muscle endurance training, the rep range is greater than 12, right? Which is twice strengths rep recommendation. And the sets are from two to three, right? So these are polar opposites. And again, they're under the same umbrella. They're under anaerobic training, which is a type of training. But they're very specific in their approach when we want to consider um, exercise-induced adaptation specificity, okay? Do we want our athletes to be strong? Do we want our athletes to have a tremendous amount of endurance? Or do we want our athletes to be somewhere in the middle of this, right? So now we have to consider how we're going to deliver the stimulus to get the specificity that we want in their performance. All right, so now let's look at HIIT training, okay? So... We could have two different versions of intensity, okay? We could have high intensity training where, again, the intensity is incredibly robust, or we could have high volume training, okay? So basically the difference is high intensity training is high energy contractions, okay? High volume training is high repetitive contractions. Now, this doesn't mean that the intensity is great, it just means the overall volume is great, okay? Now, high intensity training and high volume training are going to activate the same changes in the muscle to get a desirable adaptation, but it's going to do it through different protein cascades or signaling cascades. Now, when we do high intensity training, we are taxing the anaerobic system, okay? there is going to be a high level of ATP turnover to AMP, okay? And when we have that high level of AMP in the cell, that's a distress signal. And when the cell is at a low energy state, because AMP is higher than ATP, that is going to activate a kinase called AMP kinase, okay, AMPK. AMPK is going to get turned on because of high levels of AMP in the cell, okay? Adenosine monophosphate. You guys should all know what this is. AMPK will activate a transcription factor called PGC1-alpha. This is another protein, but this protein has a very special job. When it is turned on by a kinase, this protein is allowed access into a nucleus, okay? So it will translocate from the cytosol of the cell into the nucleus of the cell, and then it can bind to DNA. So AMPK will increase activation of PGC1-alpha. PGC1-alpha will then bind to DNA within the mitochondria, and it will tell the mitochondria to do some very specific things, okay? it will tell it to increase mitochondria biogenesis. So it will say, hey, mitochondria, make more of yourself, okay? If it has more mitochondria in the cell, 
it will increase fatty acid oxidative capacity, which means now we have more of these machines where we can bring in more of this fuel and metabolize it. It will also tell the cell to increase GLUT4 translocation. So that means that we will be able to bring in greater amounts of glucose during exercise. And we will have an increased capacity to store glycogen and use glycogen. Okay, so just because we are exercising in an intense manner and we're doing high energy contractions, right? If we're doing high energy contractions, that means that the, the time, if intensity is high, time is low, right? Or if we want to do long durations of high intensity exercise, then we have to go high intensity, low intensity, high intensity, low intensity, and that low intensity duration allows us to catch our breath and to get a break so that we can do the next wave of high intensity training, right? Now, high volume training does a very similar thing. And I told you, calcium acts as a signal in the cell. It's a secondary messenger, okay? So it will tell the cell to alter itself depending on the pattern of calcium release and calcium uptake into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, when we do repetitive contractions that are not intense, then we can get these same adaptations, but it's done through calcium. So calcium will activate a kinase called CAMK, C-A-M-K, I'm C-A-M kinase, okay? This kinase, right, this enzyme does the same thing AMPK did. It is going to turn on this master switch. It's going to turn on this transcription factor. PGC1-alpha is then going to have the ability to translocate into the nucleus and start making these same things occur, okay? So what happens is we get increased mitochondria, increased fatty acid oxidation, increased capacity to mobilize GLUT4 and bring in sugar into the cell. If we have more sugar in coming into the cell, we can store more glycogen, but we could also utilize more glycogen, okay? And what some of these changes do, specifically these two, is it starts to change the way certain muscle fibers behave. So we might get a shift to more type one muscle fibers with this type of exercise training. Now that's not saying that we are going to have more type one fibers than type two A and type two um, X, but what it is saying is you might get some hybridization where you have type two A and type two, I'm um, type one fibers becoming hybrids, okay? Um, so let's go into this with a little more detail. So this is, um, and again, I don't know why I put hit. It should be an I. I apologize again. It must have been one of those one of those uh, mornings where I just didn't have enough coffee. So I'm going to have to have to fix that. Um, so this is an article that looked at hit training and changes in gene expression. Now. If we have a change in gene expression and certain genes turn on because of exercise, well, then that means that the genes are going to create more proteins, right? So if a gene exposes itself where it can transcribe um, DNA, right, and we can make RNA, then we can change the types of proteins that are in the cell that will be more advantageous to exercise or when we're exercising. So this was a study that was conducted in a group of individuals that did six weeks of HIIT training, okay? Uh, you can see here that we have VO2 max. This is in liters per minute. We don't care about that. We want relative. This is in milliliters per kilogram per minute. And we can see that at pre, this group was sub 50 with um, VO2 max. That's, that's a pretty good score. Now, my question to you is, can HIIT training increase VO2 max? Can high intensity, primarily anaerobic training impact VO2 max? And you need to know this as a trainer or as a strength and conditioning coach or as a speed agility um, coach. You need to know if the training you're prescribing will get you the results that you want. And this study found that yes, six weeks of high intensity training, interval training, does in fact increase VO score significantly, okay? So we went from a sub 50 to about, let's say at 50, 
52-ish, 53. Um, within six weeks, that's a pretty robust spike. Now, something else that was really interesting about this paper is they looked at oxygen deficit, O2 deficit, okay? And hopefully you guys know what oxygen deficit is. Um, oxygen deficit is the, the price that we have to pay when we begin to exercise in order to reach steady state, okay? And what I mean by this is that when we start to exercise, especially if we're doing aerobic exercise, right? If we're doing aerobic exercise where we're trying to increase our VO2 max, then before we reach a steady state during exercise, there is about a five to six minute lag before we become 100% oxidative, which means that oxygen and fatty acids are providing enough ATP to support the exercise that we're doing, okay? Now, that five to six minute lag is what we call the oxygen deficit. And the reason it's a deficit is because the energy that we're using to exercise has to come from somewhere. And if oxygen and, and fatty acids aren't providing that energy yet, that energy has to come from somewhere. And where it's coming from is the anaerobic system. So for the first, let's say five, four to five minutes of exercise, if we start running, that four to, first four to five minutes, the ATP being generated is being supplied by the anaerobic energy system. So ATP, ATP phosphocreatine, anaerobic glycolysis, where we're getting lactic acid and lactic acid can be converted uh, to energy through various means. Um, and then we can get into that aerobic glycolysis where pyruvate is going into the mitochondria rather than being converted into lactic acid. And um, these systems are supplying us with the energy until we get to steady state where oxygen comes in and says, hey, I got it. I can take over here. I can supply all the energy uh, that we need for this exercise. You other systems can turn off, okay? Now that deficit um, that is being paid for by those other systems is important because that tells us we're in an anaerobic system, okay? And a really easy way to, to measure that would be to prick somebody's finger and get some blood during the first four minutes of exercise and measure lactate. So what do you guys think would happen during the first four minutes of exercise to lactate concentrations in the blood? So all of you should be saying, okay, well, if, if you know, Mr. Blackburn said that the first four minutes are being paid for by anaerobic energy systems, then you should be telling yourself that lactate levels should be increasing because the more lactate we have, the more evidence we have that we are in an anaerobic capacity, okay? So that's long-winded, but I have to explain it to you because what is interesting here is that this oxygen deficit, okay, it was low at the beginning, right? We, again, we were sub 50. Post six weeks of high intensity interval training, oxygen deficit went up. So right now you should be saying, well, how does VO2 go up and oxygen deficit go up at the same time? That's, that's what's interesting about this, is with high intensity interval training, we are getting the benefits of both aerobic and anaerobic training, and both of them are going up our capacity to supply, uh, to supply energy during those first, first few minutes of exercise increases significantly, as we can see, where did my cursor go? As we can see here. So we get better at supplying energy during those first few minutes of, of exercise and we increase our oxidative capacity. So that's, this is amazing um, work. Now, if we look over here, we're looking at enzymes, okay? One of the major changes that happens in skeletal muscle when we deliver certain types of exercise, again, we're talking about types, is that we have changes in protein concentration and changes in protein activation. So um, on this side here, we have CS, enzyme activity. So CS is citrate synthase. Um, you guys should remember that from exercise physiology. And if you don't, that's this enzyme right here. And what does that enzyme do? Well, it takes pyruvate, right? That's coming in from glycolysis. Glycolysis gets converted to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is a four-carbon molecule, right? 
um, that four carbon molecule will enter the citric acid cycle and citrate synthase will take two carbons from oxalacetate and combine it to acetyl-CoA, which will create a six carbon citrate, right? Um, so what this study is showing us is that the activity of this enzyme goes up substantially after six weeks of high intensity training, right? So now we've changed the muscle in a way where its oxidative capacity is greater. And that might be one of the reasons we see this change in VO2 max over here, okay? Another thing that occurs is uh, phosphofructose kinase. You guys should know what that is. That is that is the master regulatory enzyme in glycolysis. Its activity go, has gone up. And you guys can see from pre to post, its activity has become substantially greater. Now, because this is more active and because it can function more acutely and it's more sensitive to changes in metabolic uh, fluctuation, this change in this enzyme might have something to do with the change over here, okay? So again, the stimulus changes the muscle in a very specific manner. So type of exercise is incredibly important. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed that little break. I had to take a breather and catch my breath because I was so long-winded on that last section, but uh, I, I love this stuff. I really get into the prescription stuff. Um, so let's talk about the volume now. Volume is, uh, it gets a bit confusing for people. So volume is a product, okay? And we have to consider those first three variables that we were talking about in the FITS principle, which was F, I, and T, okay? Frequency intensity and time. So volume is a product of frequency, intensity of time. And as I said, that was the fit portion of um, exercise or exercise prescription. Now, volume can be used to estimate a couple of things. We can estimate gross energy expenditure and we can do it without a laboratory. We don't, we don't need any expensive equipment to do so. So we can do a couple of very basic calculations that will give us a in-depth look at the volume we are performing in a single exercise session or over the course of a week or over the course of a month. So um, we can use METs per minute, okay, per week, Very something very easy to do. We could also use KCALs per week. Um, and there, there's various other things we can do, but let's, let's get into this conversation a little bit and then uh, we can clarify some of this. So um, I have typed here that volume is the granddaddy of all the variables, okay? It is intensity, frequency. If we're dealing with weightlifting, it could be sets and reps. It could also be load, right? If we have weights, we have intensity and frequency, sets, reps, and weight. And all of these things are com they're components of volume. Generally, volume is calculated by sets times reps times weight. Now, that's if you are weightlifting. If you are doing something anaerobically, you, uh, like plyometrics, you can do reps times sets and get a volume of how many plyometrics you did. Okay. Or if we're doing running, we can do frequency by intensity times, times time, and we can get a volume of work done uh, for aerobic activities. So. It's volume because it's a three-dimensional uh, measurement, all right? Very similar to a jar. If we have a jar of peanut butter, we have length time, width time, height. Volume is the same thing. Volume is likely the most important training aspect that we will be talking about because it must be increased over a person's career or an athlete's career uh, in order to get the best performance we can out of that individual. Now. Volume can be detrimental as well. If we give someone too much volume, they can become injured from overtraining. Or if we give somebody too little volume, then we can uh, not hit the mark with performance. So keep all of that in mind. Um, so like a very basic uh, consideration for volume uh, when it comes to aerobic activity 
is energy expenditure. And I'm going to show you guys a very, very generic way to kind of calculate a, a cheap way to get access to how much energy somebody expended during the week. So what we would like to see with ACSM is energy expenditure of something greater than 500 to 1000 METs per minute per week. Okay, this is a reasonable target for volume. So for most adults, when we reach this type of volume, uh, we can see that these uh, this volume is associated with lower cardiovascular death rates, lower complications with uh, cardiovascular disease, and lower percentages of mortality. Um, so this is the range that research has kind of told us that uh, if you want to fight chronic illness, this is where we need to be. So what does that look like? Well, I'm going to give you guys an example. If we have someone jogging aerobically, and we set a pace at seven METs, okay? This would be our intensity, okay? This would be our time, and this would be our frequency. And as I said, volume is frequency, boom, times intensity, boom, times time, boom, okay? So if we have a 70 kilogram individual or a 70 kilogram male, and we want to calculate what this volume looks like, it's a very simple equation. Seven METs times 30 minutes times three times a week equals 630 METs per minute. Now, if we go back to that ACSM standard that I just told you guys, ACSM said if we want to fight chronic illness, we want to reduce our um, susceptibility to certain diseases, then we have to be between 500 and 1,000 METs per week. And with this volume here, we've reached it, right? We got there. Now, what does it look like if we're weightlifting and we want to do anaerobic uh, work and we want to try to calculate a volume? Well, very similar. If we're doing bench press and we look at the reps, the sets, and the weight, we can calculate volume. So let's say we did one rep, five sets of 275 pounds. And then after that, we increased it. We did two reps, three sets of 315 pounds. So then we can get a total volume for that. And that would look like this. One set times five reps times 275 plus two reps times three sets times 315. That equals a total volume of 3,000 265 pounds, right? Pretty easy. Now, let's say we've done this volume for about two weeks. We have certain variables that we can play with to increase the volume, right? We don't want to remain stagnant and we don't want to plateau. Thereby, we can change some of the variables and look at how easy this is. Let's say we kept the rep and the set range the same on both of these, right? Two and three, we kept two, two reps, three sets, kept that the same. One rep, five sets, okay, or one set, five reps. And let's just say that we increased the weight. That would be the intensity. So let's say we increased this to 300 and we increased this to 325. Just manipulating the intensity of the load would increase our volume for the week. All right. Reps and sets could stay the same. If we altered the weight just slightly, we would increase our volume for the week. Right. So this is how you could or for the session, you can keep track of your volume on a daily basis. Now, let's say we wanted to keep the weight the same. Okay. So we keep 275 and we keep 315 and let's say we want to alter the sets. So instead of doing one set, we do three. So we do three sets, five reps at 275, okay? And let's say we take this and we make it to three. So we do three sets, three reps at 315. Just by altering those variables, which are the sets, would change this substantially as well, all right? Same thing goes with jogging. If I wanted to increase my METs to eight and I did eight METs for 30 minutes, three days a week, 
that would change my total volume, right? And that would increase my volume. Or I could decrease it if I wanted to. So we can manipulate these variables to calculate volume to give us an overall look at what that regiment, that training session, look like for the day. Okay? I hope that makes sense. Now, this is this is a way we can kind of functionally use this volume, this volume idea. If I have, let's look at weights over here, volume in pounds, okay? And I have pounds and I have weeks and I have intensity, okay? So we have an individual here that has a growth in intensity, okay? So between week one, two, and three, we are manipulating one of those variables, whether it's weight or sets or reps, and every week we are manipulating that so we grow. Do you see how we're increasing here? Now when we get to week three and four, let's say that's a recovery week. So let's say we drop the weight, all right? And we know we're dropping the weight because it shows us here that we're dropping the weight, all right? So if we drop the weight and we go lower intensity, then we can see that our, that our exercise diminishes here, okay? And that should happen because we should have rest periods. We should have recovery weeks where we're not going intensely at all. And then when we start the fourth week, we start to ramp up our sets and our reps and our weight. And we can see because of that recovery week, we grew exponentially. So now we're here, right? And over the course of each week, we manipulated those variables of reps, sets, and weight. And that's what got us safely to this new, this new plateau here. And then that just repeats, right? Rest, recover, grow. Rest, recover, grow. So we can track volume so that we can accurately prescribe our intense weeks and our less intense weeks. Now, if you are a trainer and you have no idea what you're doing and you're not using those variables, you're not sure how to use those variables with reps, sets, and weight, and time, um, then you can get something that happens like this and you would never know because you're not tracking volume, right? This is just, this poor individual, this poor bastard is just on a constant uh, decrease, right? They're, they're losing their gains, they're losing their power, they're losing their strength because no one's tracking volume. All right. If you track your volume and you know what the variables are doing uh, to give you that volume value, then you should know how to increase the intensity of the exercise to get that person to grow. Okay. And what I mean by to grow is to get them to grow in performance. So let's just kind of summarize this. Okay. A summary of our uh, volume. Target volume would be anywhere between 500 and 1,000 METs per minute per week is recommended for most adults. That would be your aerobic activity. Um, this is essentially 1,000 kcals a week of moderate intensity exercise, right? So we can do all these conversions to get METs to convert to uh, kcals and we can get a value for, for kcals. Um, and this would also equate to about 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise, okay? So we can look at METs, we can look at kcals, we can look at minutes. There's all these different ways to track the volume. Um, now, when we're dealing with at-risk individuals, and we, we still have to talk about them, right? We still have to talk about um, who's at risk um, and how we have to adapt exercises to them, we have to consider that these individuals have to have a substantially lower volume, right? Um, and we can do a series of workouts, calculate the volume, and then meet and discuss the results with that client, right? And if, they're, uh, if they have poor fitness or they're dealing with a chronic disease, then we can ask them, hey, was this too much? Was it, was it not enough? Could you go harder? And through that conversation, you have volume calculated, you have their exercises recorded, and then you can find an accurate starting point to one, keep them safe, and two, get them to grow. Okay, so volume is a very uh, important variable that we, 
we can use to help our, our athletes and um, our clients. Um, and greater volumes may be needed for weight management. Now, you guys should be thinking about this. If I did greater volumes of anaerobic fitness and I was sitting on a bench press and just increasing reps, sets, and load, is that going to help me tremendously with weight management? Well, probably not because the more muscle mass you build, the more you're going to weigh on a scale, okay? Now, more muscle mass means more metabolic tissue, right? Which means that tissue is going to burn energy at a higher rate during rest. But in order to really manage weight, we have to have a high volume in the aerobic pathway because the longer that we're in aerobic uh, metabolism, the more fatty acids we're going to burn, okay? And you guys should know that. That should be something very easy that uh, you guys should understand at this point. So now we're going to move on to progression and we're going to talk about how we progress um, our clients in a safe way now that we understand all these variables. And now we're getting to our final variable and we're going to talk about progression and progression is very important and I want you guys to think about Goldilocks and the three bears. And you can pick any detail you want from that story, whether it's the bed, whether it's the porridge, um, whatever variable you want. But just remember that there were uh, three major lines from that story, which were this is too hot, this is too cold, or this is just right, or this is too hard, this is too soft, this is just right. Progression has to be in the middle. This is just right. And progression is, it can never be a one size fits all. It's completely tailored to the individual. Even if you're working with a large team, if you're working with a football team or a rugby team, progression has to be at the person's, an individual's pace. Um, because if we progress too, too fast and we progress too intensely, we're going to welcome injury. Uh, to an individual. So the most important thing to consider with progression is that everyone responds differently to it and you have to keep people's responses in the foreground of your design. All right. Um, so we have some things that we have to consider when we're recommending, recommending rates of progression and it's going to depend on a couple of variables. The first is going to be health status. Is it a athlete? Is it a healthy athlete? Is it a young, healthy individual? Is it, is it, a, is it a young, non-healthy individual? Is it somebody with chronic illness? Is it somebody that hasn't exercised in a very long time? Is it somebody that's on medication? Is it somebody that's on blood thinners? All of these things have to be kept in mind when you're progressing. Uh, physical fitness. Wh where are they on the fitness continuum? Can they run a mile? Can they not run a mile? Can they run seven miles? Is seven miles something they do on a daily basis? Um, so health, health status and fitness status are two very important things you have to keep in mind. Uh, this is the one that I have to consider the most when I'm dealing with fighters, especially when we're not in the weight room, but we're on the mats and we're actually fighting, is training responses. Um, when you're dealing with MMA fighters and you're on the mat and you're actually fighting with them, you'll have various responses and you have to keep these in mind because you want to cater to people's responses. Some people are just naturally and intuitively afraid to get hit and therefore their training, um, it becomes stifled because these certain people can't get over the fear of getting hit. Um, some people love getting hit and the moment they get hit, they get angry. And an angry response is something we don't want in any uh, competitive sport because if you are angry, you're not thinking and you're not strategizing. So, um, and then also post-training, how do these people respond to your training after it has happened? Are they walking off the field exhausted? Are they complaining of aches and pains? Are they sore for several uh, days following your training session? These are things that you have to be acutely aware of um, and you have to keep in the foreground. 
And then another one is program goals. What what are you trying to achieve with with uh, the person that you're working with or the team that you're working with? What is the overall goal? Is it to make them stronger, faster, more explosive? Is it postseason where you're just trying to maintain a certain level of physical fitness, right? With hockey players, they have, um, when they're done with their season, we prescribe hockey players a regiment of running and cycling over the summer. Um, we like to, we favor cycling because cycling takes the load off of the body. It lets their knees rest. There's no impact on the spine. We know that hockey is a very uh, tough sport with lots of impact. So again, is the program goal during the off season just to maintain physical fitness and what level of fitness do we want to maintain? Because then we have to bring in time, duration, and intensity, right? You see how all these things overlap. Um, and then progression can be done via changes to, and this is the most important takeaway here, guys, any component of the FIT principle. Any one of those can be modified, just like I told you in the volume segment, modified and changed. And you can increase volume and you can progress with changing those variables, okay? And uh, the most important thing to consider when you're manipulating fit principles is um, it has to be tolerated by the individual. And that's where you have to have uh, a very good relationship with the person where, because if you're dealing with athletes specifically, a lot of athletes will tell you that something they're doing is not too hard or it's not too heavy, okay? And that's just their nature because they're competitive, they're alphas. Um, they don't want to be beta. They don't want to be omega. So you have to be able to read their body and not be and not believe what they're saying out of their mouth. Okay, so you have to be able to read the body to determine toleration rates and if what you're giving somebody is too much or too little. And that takes practice. That's something that you'll achieve. Uh, you'll achieve that ability over the, over the course of your time working with your craft and refining your tools. Um, when training people. So, so during the initial phases of programming, um, we want to use this principle, which is start low and go slow, okay? When we're working with uh, teams, when we're working with clients, there are a lot of adaptations that are occurring behind the scene when we start training them. And then there are things that are not visible. We will not see visible adaptations until maybe four or five weeks after we've worked with them, okay? So we wanna make sure that we keep them safe. We wanna start low and we wanna go slow. Even if the person you're working with is saying, this is boring, this is, I need to work harder, they need to understand that there's this whole world of physiology that is occurring, that we have to make sure that we establish the right way before we move them too fast. An example of this is I get a lot of fighters coming into the gym that come from other schools and they wanna just get in there and spar and fight right away. But one of our models at the, at the gym is we want to break bad habits that you're bringing into the gym and we want to stop you from developing further bad habits because if you do a bad habit um, at the start of your exercise regimen, you'll carry that with you throughout your career. So we would rather have you go low and slow and learn the right technique first before you start uh, going hard and intense. So that, that, that theory can be applied to any sport whatsoever. Uh, we also want to reduce the risk of any cardiovascular events or skeletal muscle injury, um, especially when you're dealing with at-risk populations. That's, a, that's an easy one. Um, when we're trying to enhance um, adaptation or adherence um, to a program, we want our clients and our team members to be safe, okay? If we're injuring people left and right, we're not gonna get adherence at all, okay? And if you're being paid by a, a university to be a strength and conditioning coach and half of the athletes are injured, you're not gonna have a job. So keep that in mind as well. Um, so currently, um, inactive individuals, we need to, when we're dealing with inactive individuals or at-risk individuals, we need to begin at a light to moderate pace. And I, I think that's, this is from ACSM, but I think we also need to keep that in mind with any athlete we get our hands on. If you are a strength coach for the Milwaukee Bucks, right? And you're working with basketball players and that 
uh, let's say the following season, they trade a bunch of athletes and you get some new basketball players. Now, even though they're professional basketball players and they're athletes, you still need to begin light, go slow, and then move to a moderate pace because you guys have to establish a relationship. You as a trainer have to be able to identify their movement patterns and where they might get risked where they're at risk in their movement patterns. That is part of your job. That is part of your job description. All right. Um, and when we're dealing with at risk populations, duration is the first thing we increase. So keep that in mind because you're going to be asked a test question about that. And I, I hear my baby crying. So I got to, I got to wrap this up here. So uh, duration is the first variable that we increase when we are dealing with at-risk or inactive individuals. So we keep frequency down, we keep intensity down, duration is the first variable that we can play with. So when I tell you guys that um, duration is a variable that we can play with, what I mean by that is we can modify it. Um, so duration would re refer to how much time we are exercising in one bout of exercise. So ACSM recommends that we have an increase of five to 10 minutes every one to two weeks. And that's for the first four to six weeks. Now, this would be for inactive individuals. So it's very regimented. Um, it's very controlled. And we are assuring that low and slow um, approach that we were talking about in the previous slides. Now, um, I believe we have one more slide here and then I'm going to kind of sum this all up. So um, when we're talking about progression um, with any individual, after a month of exercising or more, then we can uh, basically adjust the frequency, intensity, and the time, or, or type, I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, or we could also adjust frequency, intensity, time, or frequent intensity and type. And why do we wait to uh, do this over the course uh, of a month? Well, that's because, like I said previously, we have a lot of uh, adaptations that are occurring behind the scenes, and most importantly, we've mentioned this in class, you have a lot of neurological changes that are occurring um, your first month, your first six weeks of exercise, and that's a really important thing to develop because uh, the motor unit, right, the muscle is controlled by the neuron firing, and as the neurons become more effective at firing and we get more of them through exercising, then that means that it can more... It can better control the muscle. It can better control multiple fibers. And um, it can assure that the skeletal muscle system is ready to perform in an adequate way. Also, we have neural control of the spine. So the more we prepare that system, the better the muscles surrounding the spine are equipped for um, protecting the the central nervous system and the spinal cord for movement. So there's all of these things that we have to uh, kind of strengthen first before we start to uh, exercise in a manner where we're adjusting those variables. Um, over the next four to eight months, we can continue to adjust those variables. Again, uh, measuring volume right? If we're doing um, frequency, intensity, and time or duration, uh, we can essentially um, change or modify each one of these over the course of four to eight months. And if we go back to this guy here, remember I showed you that, this would be several weeks and we know that we can change those variables over the course of this time to not only give ourselves a break and to let some downtime happen, but also to make sure that we keep progressing in a manner that is um, advantageous. I'm sorry for all the pounding. My kids are bouncing off the walls. And um, once I get done with this, I'm going to go uh, drop kick them out into the front yard. So thank you for bearing with me and uh, those disturbances.
Um, again, we're adjusting gradually. We're doing this to minimize injury, minimize overtraining. And then after any adjustment, we are going to monitor toleration and how tolerant they are. So going back to here, if we want to uh, first few weeks, there's not much of a change, right? We know that the first four weeks we're getting neural adaptations. Then we're going to take a break off or take a, a week off and just kind of decrease our total volume. And then we're going to increase and surpass our starting point. And it's at these points here that we really want to uh, take advantage of some individual time to monitor the tolerance of our, pa our not our patients, sorry, our clients and uh, our, our team members that we're working with. So as we adjust, we have to monitor. And lastly, I want to show you this slide here. And this kind of sums up everything that uh, ACSM talks about with the FIT principle. Um, now, I did not go into pattern. You guys could look at that on your own, but we did talk about these with quite a bit of detail. Um, so what I would like you to do, and the reason I put this at the end of the slide is, or at the end of the lecture here is because I didn't want to present it first because most people would look at this and be like, oh, I could just summarize it with that. Um, yes, you can summarize it, but the what I presented to you in the lecture is a lot of detail and information that I have obtained from training um, not only at-risk diabetic individuals for a very long time, but also professional and elite athletes. So I tried to cover everything in between and some of the nuances that are important to understand with this type of training. And on top of that, offer you guys a look, just a kind of a, a glimpse into some of the physiological changes that happen with exercise. Um, so that is all I have for you guys here. This was a long one. Um, do take care of yourselves and be on the lookout for the at-risk assignment that I am going to be putting up in the next day or so, and this will be uh, your exam number three. So eat your veggies, exercise, and stay well.